Great, thank you very much. Four more talks to go, so hang in there. Um, I want to acknowledge my um, co-authors. So uh, this research that I'm presenting uh, was actually done by Jessica Ron. She was a master's student of mine uh, and co-supervised by Jack Trevers. Uh, she also a, was a former uh, technician of mine as well. Uh, Hung Lee was uh, an advisor on her uh, committee. And uh, I want to thank Rick Scroggins for his uh, support uh, on this project. So I want to present on um, a test method for the evaluation of soil microbial health in a petroleum hydrocarbon contaminated boreal forest soil. So I'll present a bit of background, introduction, uh, methods and results, summary, uh, and then some conclusions. So the boreal forest in Canada, 56% of Canada's land mass is occupied by boreal forest and 80% of that is a forested area. So there's lots of hectares of land occupied by boreal forest in Canada. And uh, a number of companies um, uh, utilize areas within the boreal forest, including oil and gas, pulp and paper, mining, forestry. I think I'm talking to a converted audience here. However, you can tell that it's an ecological and uh, economical important biome. So how many contaminated sites are there in Canada? According to a CCME document, there's greater than 10,000, although in the previous talk they mentioned over 250,000, so that's pretty impressive. And most are... Uh, um, contain petroleum hydrocarbons. So you can see that there's a risk to human and environmental health. So why assess soil microbial health? Well, soil microorganisms, they function in organic matter decomposition and nutrient cycling. And basically, if you don't have that, they'll affect the terrestrial food web above that, so it's very important. In 2003, a workshop was held at Environment Canada, and it was identified a need at this workshop to develop a test suite to assess soil microbial health amongst other things like uh, single species tests, plants, um, and invertebrates and earthworms. And uh, in the CCME and the California EPA document, it's actually written in there that we should assess the soil microbial health. So the objectives of this research and of Jessica's uh, master's thesis was to first define soil microbial health and then to develop a suite of tests to assess soil microbial health. And we used three different areas microbial biomass, uh, microbial activity, microbial diversity, and community structure. Then once we had all this data, we needed to do something with it. So uh, we wanted to develop a data integration method. So our definition, and we got this definition looking at other definitions and, and going through the literature, um, looking at uh, uh, soil quality, soil health, soil microbial communities. And the definition we came up with is uh, soil microbial health is the ability of the soil microbial community to function in maintaining the site-specific soil ecosystem. So the community must be active, robust, and diverse enough to decompose organic matter and to function in nutrient cycling. So uh, there's Canada, boreal forest. We sampled in Alberta in the Swan Hills area. Um, uh, the site was provided to us by uh, uh, Worley Parsons. And, um, and they also uh, helped us in uh, grabbing samples. So what happened in eight, 1989 was that along this uh, main road, a crude oil uh, pipeline uh, broke, and the oil flowed down a hill and pooled in this particular area. So this is where we sampled our contaminated um, uh, clay soil soil, and we sampled reference soil off uh, into a healthy uh, boreal forest area. And this is what it looked like when we arrived. Of course, it snowed the night before, and there was bear tracks all over the site, but we pursued. Um, in the background, you can see healthy, healthy boreal forest. And in the foreground, you can see where the contamination took place, and there's uh, some seedlings after over 20 years that are starting to, uh, to come up. So as I mentioned, we uh, sampled the two sites, the reference site and the contaminated site. In the reference site, we sampled two horizons, the OFOH horizon and the AHG horizon pH is about 3.5, and we took five samples from each horizon. We also took a few extra samples um, as controls when we brought the soil back to the lab that we autoclaved to kill all the microbial activity. In the contaminated site, we, uh, we took two horizons as well, OFOH and AHG site. This time we took 10 samples from each site. Uh, why 10 and 5? We did um, a power analysis, and it was determined that we needed at least 10 contaminated samples and five reference samples. So um, this is just an idea of how much uh, the site was contaminated. Um, the reference uh, OF and AHG 
were uh, some samples were slightly contaminated with F4 fraction. However, most of the contamination obviously was at the contaminated site, with the F3 and F4 being the predominant uh, PHC. So uh, I'll go through each of the different methods we used in our test suite. We looked at activity, and under activity, we looked at uh, basal respiration, substrate-induced respiration, organic matter decomposition, nitrification, and the beta lamina test. Under biomass, we looked at heterotrophic plate count and fumigation extraction, although I should mention that fumigation extraction technique is really a method to determine the amount of microbial organic uh, carbon in the soil, and we use that with the basal respiration, so we uh, uh, provide the results and amount of CO2 produced per microbial organic uh, carbon. And the last, diversity and community structure, we used uh, community level physiological profiling, enzyme assays, and the genomics technique, uh, denatrient ingredient gel electrophoresis. Um, these methods we didn't make up. They're uh, ISO methods or UCD methods, or we adapted them from the literature. All right, so let's look at biomass. The first one we looked at was heterotrophic plate count. Um, that's where we uh, take the soil. Uh, we put it on uh, one tenth LB agar plates, incubate for seven days, 20 degrees Celsius in the dark. And um, what you can see is that the contaminated OFOH had the higher number of heterotrophs than the reference OFOH, and it was significantly different. Oh, I guess it was significantly different. And the uh, contaminated AHG was greater than the reference AHG, which kind of surprised us initially. Uh, looking at activity now measurements, uh, we use basal respiration. That's where we have a vial. We put a gram of soil in it, um, incubate it uh, over 20 hours, and we grab a headspace sample look at the CO2 evolved. And what we again saw was that the contaminated OFOH site had a higher amount of CO2 evolved compared to the reference OFOH, and it was significantly different. And the contaminated AHG had a higher amount of CO2 evolved than the reference AHG, and of course the autoclave samples didn't have any CO2 involved. We looked at basal respiration, so the same idea, but we added substrate to it, uh, glucose, we incubated for a shorter period of time because you have a lot more CO2 coming off. And again, contaminated OFOH had a higher amount of CO2 evolved compared to the reference OFOH, and the contaminated AHG had a lot more CO2 evolved than the reference uh, AHG, and of course the um, autoclave didn't have any. Move on to nitrification. Uh, what we do is we add alfalfa as a source of ammonia to the soil, and we incubate it um, over uh, a little over 40 days. We grab a sample and we look at the amount of nitrate and nitrite produced, and the uh, reference OFOH had the highest amount of uh, uh, nitrate and nitrite produced, whereas the contaminated, both the contaminated horizons and the reference AHG were not, were not typically different than the uh, uh, autoclave soil. Organic matter decomposition was a test where we just added filter paper, sandwiched in between soil, kept the moisture contact, the content the same over 180 days, and sampled. And in this you'll see that the reference uh, OFOH had the highest amount of uh, uh, or organic matter decomposition, uh, whereas the, both the contaminated horizons and the reference AHG horizon were not that significantly different than the uh, uh, autoclave soil. In the bait lamina test, it's a, a quite a simple test. Uh, we just add these plastic uh, sticks with bait added in these, these holes that are in the, uh, in, the, in the plastic. And I think there's uh, 12 holes in there. And we look at the amount of bait eaten over time, or, or, or we look at the, the holes that are produced in the, uh, um, in the stick over time. And we, uh, so what we found was that the reference OFOH had the highest amount of holes eaten over time compared to uh, the other samples, the contaminated uh, uh, horizons and the reference AHG were not that significantly different than the autoclave soil. Uh, we looked at uh, community level physiological profile. Uh, what that is, it's a 96 well plate. Each well holds about 300 microliters. Um, the, the, the plate has 31 different substrates in it in triplicate and uh, three um, um, blank wells. And we look at the average well color development. So if a community can use a substrate in the well, the well will change color. So we look at the average well color development. And what we found was that the reference OFOH had the highest amount of uh, average well color development, so utilizing the most substrates, whereas the, both the contaminated horizons were very similar 
to the uh, reference uh, AHG uh, horizon, and the um, autoclave samples didn't go above baseline. And we looked at seven different enzyme uh, assays. Um, I won't go through each of the different uh, enzyme uh, assays we, we looked at, but if you just compare the reference AHG to contaminated AHG, there's not a significant difference, and they're not any different than the autoclave soil. Um, the activity was greatest within the reference OFOH compared to the contaminated OFOH. And the last test we looked at for community structure was denatient gradient gel electrophoresis, and for those not familiar with it, what we do is we grab total genomic DNA from the soil, and we uh, PCR amplify the DNA using specific primers. We get a 400 base pair sequence, and we run that out of specialized uh, acrylamide gel, a denatrient gel. And this gel separates the DNA fragments by the ATGs and Cs, as opposed to the length. And you, you end up getting a banding pattern. And each of the bands within that should represent the dominant species within that uh, environment. So what you end up with is um, each one of these is uh, uh, a gel that we ran, we lined them all up using phylogenetic analysis. And just looking at a 3D plot, you can see that um, the uh, reference AHG uh, clustered very well together, for so very similar microbial communities. Some of the reference OFOH clustered here, but there were some outliers over here. The um, contaminated OFOH clustered predominantly up around here, and you, although you do see some outliers. And the contaminated HG clustered more down here with some outliers. Um, so really, it depends on where you're sampling from. You'll get this kind of uh, heterogeneity. Um, we also did a non-metric uh, multidimensional scaling analysis. And what this is, um, if you look at each of the different soil types, and those are the large triangle circles um, in, this, in this figure. And all the, the gray small dots are um, each of the bands that we got using run, running DGGE. And we compared this to 24 different physical chemical uh, characteristics of the soil. And out of all the soil characteristics, the only characteristics that caused clustering, uh, over 30% clustering of the, uh, of the bands was the petroleum hydrocarbons. All right, so we have all this data. What does it mean? What do we do with it? We want to develop a data integration method. So we used two things, biological effect, called MD. So for all the tests except DGGE, the percent difference between the contaminated and reference soil mean measure was used. For DGGE, we used the A value generated from the multi-response permutation procedure. We also looked uh, at the statistical difference. We used P value observed through pairwise comparison. And each of the horizons was scored. Uh, so we, the reference AHG was compared to the contaminated AHG, and the reference OFOH was compared to the contaminated OFOH. And so for um, the MD score, if the uh, percent difference was less than 20%, we scored it a zero. Between 20 and 30%, we scored a one. And greater than 30%, we scored a three. So the highest possible score was three. For DGG analysis, uh, again, use the A value. If it was less than 0.1, we scored a zero. Between 0.1 and 0.3, a one. And greater than 0.3, we gave it a three. So again, the highest score is three. For the statistical significance, uh, for the p-value, if it was greater than 0.1, we scored a 0. Between 0 0.05 and 0.1, we scored a 1. And less than 0 0.05, we scored a 2. So the highest possible score was a 2. So then if you combine the MD score and the SS score for each of the tests, the highest score you can get is a 5. We had eight tests, so the highest, uh, the highest score you would get for all the tests used on a particular soil horizon would be 40. All right, so and then we developed a rubric. <clears throat> and what we uh, came up with was if a score was between 0 and 13, it was relatively unimpacted. A score between 14 and 26, it was the soil microbial health was impacted. And between 27 and 40, the uh, soil microbial health was severely impacted. So here's all our data. Um, here's all the tasks, the uh, organic matter decomposition, heterotrophic plate count, nitrification, CLPP, and beta lamina. For the enzyme assays, we combined those together because really we're looking at enzyme assays, so we took them all and divided it by the number of assays we used. Same with uh, respiration. We used substrate-induced respiration and basal respiration, so we considered those one task, divided those by each other, divided by the number of tasks. And the last one was uh, DDGE. So we did that for the uh, uh, HG horizon, and we did it for the SS score as well. And the total score for the HG horizon was 19 out of 40. So based on that, our soil microbial health was deemed to be impacted in the contaminated HG soil. 
We did the same for the OF, OH horizon, adding up all the scores, and we got a total score of 27 out of 40. Therefore, the soil microbial health was deemed to be severely impacted in the OF, OH horizon. So in summary, um, soil microbial health was defined, test suite was, suite was used and examined. Um, this was the first run of this test suite um, uh, at Environment Canada, and data integration method was developed. So our conclusion, soil microbial health was impacted in the AHG soil and severely um, impacted in the OF, OH soil. And because uh, higher trophic levels rely on this, we could conclude that the trophic levels would be impacted as well. So uh, current and future work, um, in September uh, we had some sample that was collected and sent to us again. It was Alberta boreal forest soil, but it was PHC contaminated and metal contaminated from ABE, a, a Tetra Biotech company. Uh, we're also looking at um, spiking soils with nanomaterials, silver nanoparticles, and this is an important uh, program within Environment Canada. Uh, future testing, we're going to look at metal contaminated soils, so um, um, from, a, from a smelter, downwind from a smelter, they're uh, uh, weathered uh, samples, we're going to take a look at those, the summer sample, and take a look at those, and with the hope of developing a uh, guidance document for soil microbial health. So with the samples that we received in September, I just want to um, show you kind of uh, the data as it comes out. Um, a co-op student I had developed this, this graph, and I thought that was kind of neat, so I'm, I'm using it. And uh, she asked the question, uh, did contamination impact the soil microbial community? So in the current study that I just went through with you, the answers are right here. For heterotrophic plate count, no. For the two respiration tests, yes. And for the other tests that I went through, yes, it was impacted. With the soil that we received, um, the, the, the current soil from the uh, PHC contaminated and metal contaminated, uh, heterotrophic plate count was not impacted, but the respiration two tests were impacted. Um, nitrification was not impacted, bait lamina and CLPP was not impacted, and we're finding out uh, as the data comes in that the organic matter decomposition is not impacted. So we're seeing an opposite of result from what we saw with the, with the study I just presented. Um, and there's, there's probably a reason for that. Um, this is the uh, analysis of the soil. And the petroleum hydrocarbon uh, concentrations within the soil was about half of what we had in the study I just went through with you. Additionally, uh, the uh, reference soil was an AHG soil, whereas the contaminated soil was a land treatment material, and it was a sandy loam soil, so slightly different. The uh, reference pH was 5.4, was the contaminated pH soil was about uh, 7.2. And there was a lot more soluble salts in the contaminated soil as compared to the reference soil. So it had been amended to foster a healthier uh, environment. So based on that, um, I would almost determine without doing all the analysis, but we're going to finish the analysis, that it's not impacted. And this isn't really a bad story. I think it's a good story. You have a, a soil that's been contaminated. Um, it's, been, it's been remediated and the healthy, they have a healthy soil microbial community in there. So the hydrotrophic levels will, should be fine. So I think it's a good, a good story. Um, acknowledgements, um, I want to thank Paul Villeneuve for doing our uh, statistical analysis for us, Josh Newfield, University of Waterloo for helping us with our DGG analysis, Michael Wontraub and Zachary Reichs from University of Toledo uh, helping Jessica do the uh, enzyme assays. Uh, we had a number of people help within Environment Canada and, and a number of co-op students. Uh, Worley Parsons for our, our, uh, our sampling um, our initial sampling and EBA, Catherine Bessie for the, the recent samples we have, and of course, uh, PURD for, for funding. And of course, Jessica is happy she uh, finished her master's.